the Joe Rogan experience. Meat is the most nutrient-dense, perfect food for humans. It just is. It's such an exhausting conversation when you say that to people, though. Like you said, I think, you know, you eating all that meat? Like, what about your cholesterol? What mm -hmm. about, you, you going to have a heart attack? Yeah, and it's working its way into policy, which is really disturbing to me, yeah. like, as a mother. Like, New York City public schools, vegan on Fridays now, in addition to Meatless Mondays. So now you've got a school system where 70% of the kids are economically disadvantaged and might go home on the weekends like they need school lunch right and now you're be you're you're flanking the weekends with nutrient poor both friday and monday and it's this ideologically driven thing that's based on this idea that if you eat less meat it's better for the environment like this thing that they say and they also say for health purposes like right. oh they'll, they'll, they'll cite the china study like it's one fucking study and like no matter how much you say like hey you need to read the rebuttals of the china study yeah. because they're pretty brutal and it's it shows that it's a lot of biased evidence and that they really didn't do a good job of being objective about that so there's one thing that's that's coming up that's happening right now that's really interesting so there's this thing called the global burden of disease and this is published by the lancet and it's what most global food policy is set on and between their report in 2017 and 2019 meat was 36 times more likely to kill you and there were some researchers some friends of mine that pushed back they wrote a letter to the lancet which was blocked. The Lancet, uh, it sounds like, is finally going to be publishing it like over the next couple days. Finally and, publishing this thing that says that meat is 36 more times. Oh, oh no, that's out. The that's 2019 out. Global Burden of Disease is out. And I actually had a, um, a graphic on that just so to show. what are you saying is going to be published? So some friends of mine. Rebuttal? Right, because these guys didn't provide any evidence at all uh, as to why meat. So there's this theoretical minimum risk exposure level that, you know, is supposed to be the safe level of meat you can eat. And it went um, down to zero, according to these researchers, which is going to be global food policy. You can now eat zero red meat safely with no, so that they said they did their own systematic review, but they were, they didn't show any of the evidence, any of the papers I reviewed. And there aren't, there's no research that's strong that's showing meat is, okay, there's only they, one randomized control trial. If they're not showing you evidence, any evidence, they're mm -hmm. not, not showing any papers, mm -hmm. then, how, is this, how is this science? Right, and so finally, The Lancet is gonna publish this paper where my colleagues are questioning the results and where is the science. And The Lancet, I mean, the global burden of disease is The Lancet. So this is a really very big deal. So I don't understand. Like, what is there? I, I always thought that with scientific papers, you had to cite sources and you had mm -hmm. to. So up until about two years ago, that was pretty consistent. And then I think we've seen a loosening of <laughs> standards. Oh, yeah. Here's the difference between 2017 and 2019. So you can see the top part is what we're doing in excess. And you can see that diets high in red meat used to be a very small percentage of like the cause of death globally, mm -hmm. which is even a silly thing. But it was it used to be sodium was much higher. And now meat has gone up. Do you see this? 36 times more likely to be the cause of death. How is that? In two years. So this is the study. This mm -hmm. is and. and this analysis, when when they're doing this, how are they coming to this conclusion? Right. Nobody knows. They Nobody just knows. tell you? They're, they're, they're just saying it. They're just saying it. So what is their motivation? We don't really know. Um, I mean, I, a little tinfoil hatty. I, I think that there's a powerful desire to consolidate food production globally. And this is an amazing way to do it. it, it, it it's... Uh, as it is, there's I, I think that six or seven companies produce like 90 percent of the food that's consumed globally. But what we've seen over time is just more consolidation, more consolidation. And there's this kind of weird interface between tech and venture capital and food. There have been some interesting pieces where folks are looking at food like they want it to be operated like IP, 
like software. They want you to be able to own the it's intellectual property. It's interesting you say that because Bill Gates is now the largest owner of farmland in the United States. <sighs> yeah. We looked at that up once. There was some sort of dispute about that, but then we looked at it said he was. He wants right? to be. He's, he owns a lot. He put it that way. The Gates, yeah. Gates Foundation is one of the major sponsors of this study that okay. I was just talking so about. So it's fuckery. So, and, but the thing is, like, he keeps saying that we've got to eat less meat. And, you know, we've got to cut our consumption of meat out to be healthy and that we're going to get used to these meat alternatives. When a guy like that says that, I'm like, are you making money because of this? Like, why are you saying that? And by the way, you look like shit. Like, because if you're eating those those plant based burgers or whatever the fuck you're doing, like you're obese. Like a guy like that telling people about he's got these breasts Moves. and this this gut. And I'm like, this is crazy. You're one of the richest guys on Earth. You have access to the best nutrients, the best, you could have a, an amazing trainer, you, you could be in phenomenal shape, and you're giving out public health advice. You're, you're giving out health advice, and you're sick. It's like a, literally like a non-athlete trying to coach professionals. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? How are you giving any health advice when you look like that? Your health is piss poor. I'm not a doctor, but when you've got man boobs and a gut and you're walking around, and you have these like toothpick arms. I'm like, hey, buddy, you're not healthy. There's a lot of profit to be made in in processing something into a Beyond Burger. There's a lot of profit to be but made. But those aren't even selling anymore. Have you noticed that? Yeah, they, they it, we're kind of lucky in a way. Like the, the consumers kind of got in and poked around that. And there was uh, Forbes did an interesting piece where they it, there was so much interest from the vegan community around Impossible Burger and Impossible Foods. And this Forbes piece was interesting. It made the case that these people are usually very progressive and very anti-corporation were like the biggest fans or, or you know, promoters of this corporatization of our food system, which, mm. which is kind of where – all the stuff is going. What they're we're getting duped. They really are. But, it, you know, it's it, on the one side, there's this story that meat will cause cancer and diabetes and all this stuff. And it's going to destroy the planet because of carbon emissions. And it, it's using all the water and the land. And, and it's a it's a slick story. It's a it's an elevator pitch. It's elegant. It's like buttoned up airtight. And then when we start trying to unpack that, it, I, I you have to dig into ecology and non-equilibrium thermodynamics, and it's not an elevator pitch, and it, it's a lot of work to to unpack what those claims are. And then, you know, even what is the motivation to do this, then we start getting into conspiracy theory land. It's like, well, there are people that want to control the food system, and they want to, you know, turn food into intellectual property that they own. Mm. But I... It, so, that really seems to be what's going on with this. And and I think they're they're ne they've realized consumers aren't going to just buy it in the grocery store. And by the way, it's twice as expensive. Like Beyond Burger is twice as expensive as organic grass fed beef per pound. Wow! But they sell it in half pound packages right next to the pound packages, and so oh, they're tricky. Hmm. But so why not just make it policy and indoctrinate these kids from kindergarten to age twelve with these messages? Like the Meatless Monday messages are all wrong. Like, what they're is all the wrong. message? Uh, meat is bad for your health and the environment, and and they use these beautiful simplistic infographics showing you know livestock takes up three quarters of the land, but but okay, but it's not talking about the types of land you know, or that your burger used ten bathtubs full of water. But then we're not talking about okay, the the most of the water footprint for a cow is actually in the grass. It's called green water. It's like water that's already in the environment, in rain, whether the cow is there or not, it's going to happen. Do we have that infographic? Yeah, that I have the, really... the water If you want to talk about how much water uh, a, a burger uses up, you better not be eating almonds. Exactly. Yeah. You exactly. better not be eating almonds. Or... You better shut your mouth if you're eating almonds. Right. Yeah. Those things are ridiculous. So here's the water one, and I've broken it down, land use, feed use, but this is just the water one. And so what most people don't get is that there's, you know, green water is natural rain, and then the blue water is like what when you look down on a map and see rivers and lakes. So what we're looking at, folks that are just listening, is when you look at typical beef versus grass-finished beef, it looks like there's probably like... 
How many dots are on this? A these little things? different. So we're we're at the bottom. I have the percentages. So it's ninety four percent green water for typical beef and ninety seven percent green water for average. And this is average. Like in Vermont, it might be different than Nevada, but so they have it broken down to these droplets. And these droplets, there's a hundred droplets on each side, and two droplets from the grass finished beef are lake streams and underground water. Three droplets from the typical beef. So, and that's what everybody's concerned about. What people are really concerned about, they're concerned about the draining of the lakes and streams and the underground water. So it's not water. drinking water. So, right. It's- and the rest of it, the entire graph, is natural rain, which is rain that exists, moisture that exists in, well, in vegetable it, matter. Yeah, and I mean, it's matter. going to fall on this land, mm-hmm. which is land that has been grasslands for eons. And we right. can't use it for anything else. When people say we, we use all this land for cattle, that's, you know, bison are a, a good example. I'm good friends with the folks that own a roam-free bison ranch in Montana. They, they do both cattle and bison because the cattle don't go up these super steep mountains. And so, the, you know, they're these grassland mountains that the bison graze. And if they don't graze it, then the whole ecosystem just collapses. The, the, the ecosystem has been this plant-animal interaction for millions of years. And, and this plant-animal re- interaction is based on the animal's manure, yep. fertilizes the plants, the animals eat the plants. Dung and, beetles, mm-hmm. insects, birds, yeah. you know, all this stuff. So it's not stealing land from anything. This is what grasslands do. It's not stealing water from anything. This is the rain, sleet, and snow that falls on the grasslands. And these animals should be there because it's part of a healthy ecosystem. Like the Audubon Society in the last 10 years has been getting really involved in regenerative ag because one of the first things that they see when people start doing pasture-based meat is that the bird species come back and come back in in remarkable profusion because it starts fixing – if you fix all of the ecosystem issues, then these literal canary in the coal mines end up getting addressed and we see more bird species come back. 